everybody. Welcome back to the Combo Couch. I am Fiorella Isabel, and I am joined today by previous Congresswoman and wonderful human being, Dr. Cynthia McKinney. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> I really enjoyed our last conversation with Pasta. You know, we pretty much like asked you questions about everything. Yes, um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we kind of figured out that you kind of a little bit understand what's happening. Um, and it, it was it's just so rare to find people that have been inside the political machine yes. and understand really what is going on at the level that really every congressperson should understand or should, you know, be honest about yes. knowing because a lot of people do know they're just dishonest about it. Um, so thank you again. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, happy to have you. I, I really wanted to dive into your brain about what's going on with Israel and Palestine today and how years ago that, you know, how we've come to this point stemming from years ago. So I yes. would like to hear your words about your experience in the flotilla to Gaza in 2009 and how you ended up in Israeli prison. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, it started out that I had done the um, 2008 well, actually, it starts. Uh, my story starts in on March seventeenth, which is my birthday. In ah. to yeah, <laughs> mine's and, March fourth. Oh, so. okay, yeah. okay, yeah. <laughs> A fellow Pisces traveler, yeah. <laughs> and um, so uh, on my birthday, I gave myself a present, and I believe that it was one of the most important speeches that I have ever given in my life. Because in that speech, uh, I participated in a protest in front of the Pentagon. And in that speech, I declared my independence, my personal independence from all of the national leadership that was responsible for uh, taking our country into war and um, producing the veterans that were maimed, the uh, seniors that were neglected, the children that were forgotten, the whole social implications, societal implications of the ascendancy of the US war machine. I expressed it in that speech and it was only three minutes long, in fact, um, I use that speech as an exemplar for my students in political science for their own preparation for uh, when I have a module in my course where they have to give speeches as well. And I use that as one of the exemplars. So you can say a lot in a little amount of time. So um, that's when my story starts because by that time I was so fed up what happened in the previous uh, election was that I had been targeted by the Democrats. Rahm Emanuel was leader of the DCCC and he um, recruited someone to run against me in the Democratic primary because they were counting their pro-war votes. And if you recall, the anti-war movement was very strong. It was very powerful. We were putting hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. And um, quite frankly, the powers that be, the deep state, the war machine inside the Congress was not pleased with that. And so um, uh, they wanted to make sure that they had enough votes to carry through with the appropriation of funds to carry out the whole series of wars that we now know were planned because Wesley Clark told on them. And um, so uh, the vote was very close 
And it turned out that the vote was exactly, the Democrats did not have one single vote to spare. The vote to fund the Iraq war passed exactly with the requisite number of votes, 218, which means that if I had been there to vote no, the measure would have failed. And wow. so I was absolutely beside myself because it clearly demonstrated that the popular support or lack of support for the war had been thwarted by Democratic Party operatives who wanted war. And, um, and my removal resulted in the passage of the funding for the Iraq war. So um, with that, that was my, my, my gift to myself was to declare my independence from that leadership. That was the beginning of the, my end, the end of my relationship with the Democratic Party. And so then after, the, so then I accepted the Green Party nomination for uh, president. And um, after that process was over in December, after Christmas, I got a phone call from a, a friend of mine uh, who said, uh, Cynthia, do you, <laughs> would you like to go to Gaza? And I, I still remember it to this day. Um, my, I, I, I hung up the phone. I said, yeah, of course. I didn't even think about it. I didn't think twice about it. Um, and I, I said, I'm going to, I said, hung up the phone and I told my mom and dad who was sitting there, I'm going to Gaza. <laughs> and they couldn't believe it. And uh, they further couldn't believe that I was going to go to Gaza on a boat because I didn't know how to swim. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, I um, boarded the boat, went to the boat, and um, we were departing from Cyprus. This was the Free Gaza Movement. And uh, I was pleased to join other activists who uh, were courageous enough to or maybe crazy enough to get on a boat um, and travel across the Mediterranean to go into Gaza waters, which they should have sovereignty over, but they don't. And uh, the first time we, we did, the Israelis played a cat and mouse game with us all night. They would come up close, just like the prowler, and then they would lay back, and then they would come up close again, and shine that great, big, huge light on us, and then they would draw back. And then one time, they came up close on us, and they didn't stop. And we were in just a little pleasure boat. It was old which was the reason that we were saved because had it been a new uh, sort of fiberglass, you know, less sturdy boat, it was good solid wood. Had it been a, a new bo boat, it would have been totally destroyed. As it was, it was destroyed. It was no longer seaworthy when the Israelis finished with us. But uh, we, so we spent the night trying to figure out, okay, how in the world, you know, who's going to rescue us? How are we going to get there? Bought the boats taking on water. And so we, we just didn't know. Eventually, Lebanon, Lebanon sent their Navy out to get us because this was all being covered by CNN and and uh, Al Jazeera, we had two reporters on board with us and uh, they were there and they were with us. So Al Jazeera, and the, I mean, we were greeted when we reached the shores of Lebanon, we were greeted, there were thousands of people waiting for us. It was like an international story. And uh, the, that, that was the good part, the, the, the sad part, was that we still didn't make it to Gaza. Right. So um, what the was their Gaza excuse, by the way, for, for coming after you when you were, it was humanitarian aid that you were delivering? 
Oh, the Israelis don't have to give an excuse. The Israeli, in fact, after they rammed our boat and disabled us, they offered to rescue us. But of course, you know, we weren't going to accept that. Thank goodness right. the Lebanese uh, stepped in and uh, provided rescue for us. But uh, the, the, the Israelis act with arrogance and impunity. So then um, after that episode was over, a few months later, I got another phone call from Free Gaza Movement. They had raised an, enough money to get another boat. This time it was steel, it wasn't um, wooden. And uh, so, it, it was like impossible for them to ram it and destroy it like that. So they asked me, uh, you want to go to Gaza again? And I said, sure, I want to go to Gaza. Let me, <laughs> let's try it again. So um, we are on this boat. It was the spirit of humanity was the name of this boat. And um, this time was a little different. The Israelis didn't they played with us for a little while and they did all kinds of things there's like this new technology new at the time probably not really new it was new to us where they could make waves so they made waves and uh the boat you know that was just trying to tip us over and um uh that didn't work they shut down our gps hoping that we would go uh, we would veer into Israeli territorial waters. Um, that didn't work because the captain, I asked the captain, I said, how, how, you know, how did you maintain course? And he said the old fashioned way, he used the stars. And, and that was wonderful. Um, uh, that was the time number two. And, um, but this time the Israelis boarded the boat. And that's how I ended up in prison because they, they captured us, made us hold our hands up. When we got off, you know, the television cameras were there and the, it was nighttime and, you know, this great big bright light shining on us. We're walking, you know, um, like this and, and uh, we are captured. Yeah. we were captives and they and took us so i was just yeah i was just gonna ask you yeah how long they kept you and what in this this time that i read that they told you that they were going to let you go they were just checking like your background or what or what you were doing etc that's that's what the press released at least Oh, okay. Well, see, I'm not even aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, they didn't let us go. And um, so there were two Israeli citizens that were with us. They let them go. But the rest of us, I think there were probably about 10 of us all together that they um, uh, held. And uh, of course, I was the only US citizen and I was there for a full seven days. The only one who the, the, the only one who left after me was uh, Marate McGuire, the Nobel Peace Laureate from Northern Ireland. And that was because she chose to remain there to make the point. But um, I had one visit from uh, the State Department. Basically, the State Department just didn't, doesn't exist. Anything happened to US citizens, you're basically on your own. And we were on our own. I was um, <clears throat> Romley prisoner number 88794. 88794 was my prison number. Yeah. And, you know, and I had a mugshot and everything, just, you know, like a common criminal. Um, because to the Israelis, I was a common criminal. Yeah, just for so, trying to get humanitarian aid to an occupied Palestine. That's right. Um, That's right. So it gets worse because on May 31st, 2010, Israel led a military raid against six civilians, ships of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla on the international waters of the Mediterranean Sea, 
And then these nine activists were killed in one ship during the raid and 10 Israeli soldiers were wounded. How did people react at that time? And what can you tell us about how you dealt with it when that happened? Well, um, there's good news and there's bad news. The, 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 the good news for me personally is, well, I guess I shouldn't even call it good news, but the circumstance was that uh, I had been invited to participate in yet another um, movement. That was the um, IHH, which was the, they're headquartered in Turkey. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a charitable organization and they sponsored the Mavi Mamara. So the Mavi Mamara was a great big, huge boat and it was uh, laden with humanitarian assistance for, for Gaza. Now, mind you that while we're doing all of this and in between the times that we're going to Gaza, Gaza is being bombed by the Israelis. So, you, you, you know, uh, uh, they're bombed. Then you go back and they've been bombed again. And... Um, well, what can I say? It's just like destruction after destruction after destruction. Well, anyway, so uh, my father had been diagnosed with cancer. And so uh, I was not able to go to Mavi Mamara on the Mavi Mamara. And I was asking myself, I was saying, why do they keep announcing in the Israeli newspapers that I was going to be on the Mavi Mamara because I was going to be on the Mavi Mamara. The, there was a seat that was there for me and I had confirmed yes. And then my, when this happened with my father, I said, I can't, I can't leave now. I can't go. So I gave my ticket to, to Joe Medors. Joe Medors is a USS Liberty veteran. And so I thought that was fitting that Joe would take my place, not recognizing that the Israelis were going to board the Mavi Marmara. They had a kill list, is what I was told. And um, uh, people got killed. And um, uh, Ken O'Keefe was on the uh, ship. And he fought back. The, the Israeli soldiers repelled from the air down onto the ship. A horrific scene that resulted in the loss of life. I believe nine people were killed. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, it's just uh, on the one hand, uh, there but for the grace of God, you know, sort of thing. But then on the other hand, it's like, well, you know, uh, no one should have to die because they want their freedom. They want sovereignty. They, they want their country to be free. No one should have to die for that. And, um, and yet the, what that showed me was that uh, it really didn't matter the, 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 the situation in Gaza, it re when people say that it's an open air prison, it really is an open air yeah. prison where people can't get in and they can't get out. Was there any media attention to, th to that attack? I mean, that is, that is not just, you know, sending bombs to kill Palestinians, which is obviously terrible, but that is a direct attempt to assassinate activist against yes. you know israel so was there any like media outrage how was that like at the time really there was no media outrage um because you know it's like well you know you activists you deserve it um and this go the, the, there's this arrogance that goes along with with the the Israelis and the pro-Israel people who are in the U.S. Congress, because I had Nita Lowy come to me and say, Cynthia, um, uh, every vote, uh, uh, what did she say to me? 
um, every vote has a consequence. That's what she told me. And so that was basically her reasoning why Rahm Emanuel targeted me for elimination from the Congress, why um, the pro-Israel lobby and its supporters inside the United States wrote checks to my opponent, why it was okay that the apparatus of the Democratic Party was used to support another country instead of people who were fighting for freedom for their own country, for crying out loud, which I'm talking about inside the United States, and others who were targeted along with me. Now, I did, I did those um, actions, activist actions, after I left the Congress. But before I left the Congress, while I was in the Congress, the pro-Israel lobby had targeted uh, they targeted Earl Hilliard. Earl Hilliard was the first black member of Congress elected since reconstruction from Alabama. And they targeted him because he dared to exercise the prerogatives of a member of Congress. He found out that the Israelis were using experimental weapons against the Palestinians and he just the knowledge alone was sufficient for them to target him and kick him out of office. So here you have black people who never before had had the opportunity, not since reconstruction, had the opportunity to elect someone to integrate the congressional delegation of Alabama and they kick him out, not because of what's happening in Birmingham, but because of what's happening in Tel Aviv. And that oh, happened boy. time and time and time and time again. Um, and so um, if you remember, they targeted, um, they targeted uh, Jim Trafficant from Ohio. And Trafficant was a friend of mine and he turned to me and he said, Cindy, because, you, you know, a lot of times they call me Cindy, uh, Cindy, you're next. And sure enough, after they dispensed with Jim Trafficant, then they turned to Earl Hilliard and me and um, <clears throat> elimination of these new congressional districts that sent us there. So you had the redistricting wars that would not allow Blacks in the South to elect anyone on their own without having to go through the powers that be in Washington, D.C. that are all controlled by the pro-Israel lobby. And that was Democrats doing that as well as Republicans, right? That's Democrats. That was Democrats. Yeah. In fact, on my... Um, uh, first concession speech, I've given quite a few of them. I gave two. Um, but in my first concession speech, I acknowledged that the uh, Republicans, well, this is what I said, the Republicans wanted to beat me more than the Democrats wanted to keep me. And the fa sad fact of the matter was that I had become a thorn in the side to the um, APAC and the pro-Israel operatives, because these people are operatives, they're inside the United States government, either as elected officials in the Congress, or they are appointed in the executive branch. But these are operatives for another country, and they're inside our government. Now, mind you that um, shortly after our election, Israel had its election, and the new members of the Knesset had to give up their citizenship, their second passports. They had to give them up in order to serve in the Knesset. Uh, uh, Israel right now is deporting members of the Black Hebrew Israelite community in Demona. They're kicking them out. They're deporting them because is what goes for Israel doesn't go for the United States. 
The United States has to have open borders. The United States has to have dual citizens. Uh, everything that operates inside the United States is the opposite. And is, it's all advocated by these very people who are operating on this dual level. You did an interview with RT in 2010, and you talked about, I think it was like a six minute interview where you talked about the executive branch being bought by Israel. Can you explain what you mean by that and how that continues today? Well, it's not just the executive branch, it's the legislative branch uh, as well. And we mm -hmm. had a great fight over the, the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, uh, which was the problem, one of the problems, I believe, that um, manifested with the uh, Trump appointments was because uh, there was this underlying never stated issue of uh, will we have Israel firsters on the uh, Supreme Court? And uh, Donald Trump, well, um, I think uh, what they were concerned about was that he was not going to be a reliable Israel firster. And, uh, and so uh, they couldn't be uh, sure that Kavanaugh was gonna be a reliable Israel firster. And also the situation with Amy Coney Barrett as well, that these two appointment, these two Trump appointments were not reliable Israel first appointments. And so that is the unseen, unwritten, unstated uh, motivation that underlies a lot of what happens in Washington, D.C. You have these groups that are vying for power and um, ultimate power, the ability to veto whatever the president wants to veto whatever the majority in the Congress want. And so possession of that veto power is the ultimate fight in Washington, DC. In fact, um, <clears throat> if you go back and you look throughout history, there was a time when, uh, well, before you were born, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but when I was very, very young, the issue was whether or not the United States would tolerate a Roman Catholic president. And that was the main issue when John Kennedy was running. And that was an undercurrent, but it wasn't only an undercurrent, it was actually discussed openly. To whom would JFK be more loyal? Would he be more loyal to the US Constitution? or would he be more loyal to the Vatican? And I think time has demonstrated that he was loyal to the US Constitution, which is what got him into trouble. <laughs> and, uh, but, but that was an issue. The dissimilarity with that situation is that today, the issue of the loyalty of uh, Israel firsters to the United States is not an issue. It's not discussed. You're not allowed to debate it. And so therefore, um, is whatever happens in Israel, it happens in Israel. But uh, you can't even ask for the same kind of consideration for your own country. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people point out that, you know, Israel has health care for all. They have a higher standard of living. Yeah higher uh, longevity of life. And it seems like a lot of the people who are on the right, who are America first, kind of lose sight of that because you do see Donald Trump and others being extremely pro-Israel. So it, that whole notion just falls apart. Um, and you know, today we have progressives like Rashida Tlaib, who is a Palestinian. We have progressives like AOC, who currently recently voted present on for the Iron Dome from changing her no vote to a present vote after speaking with Pelosi. Um, and Bernie Sanders was recently uh, divulged that he is going to vote yes on the billion dollars for the Iron Dome because Chuck Schumer told him that he will send 
aid to, into Gaza. And, you know, my question for you is, is there any way these progressives are allies? Because a lot of us get in a lot of trouble when we, when we go after these people who, you know, some people look at as frauds because they ran on anti-war, on, you know, for the, for the working class. But it seems like at every turn, especially when it comes to foreign policy, they capitulate. I mean, uh, half of the squad just voted for sanctions on Cambodia. It, it, it's, it's, are these people ever going to be allies, especially in regard to Israel-Palestine? Sanders is the most progressive senator we have, according to many. And yet, even he is, is uh, going to vote for this funding. Well, Sanders isn't progressive as far as I'm concerned. If you support <laughs> war, you, I mean, if you support the U.S. war machine, then you're not progressive. So let's be very clear. Sanders is not progressive. And the, the so-called squad, they're not progressive. I'm progressive. And I, even I have made mistakes along the way, but I, I, I know that I am far more progressive than anybody who's called progressive today. So let's just be clear that they are not progressive. For, for, the, for the most part, you know, I didn't have $20 million put in my uh, bank account so that I could make sure that progressive Democrats were elected. That, that kind of money doesn't flow to people who think like me. And uh, it didn't flow to the others who truly were progressive, but who were targeted by the so-called new progressives. They aren't progressive. And so therefore, uh, they're not our allies. And we have to understand they are not our allies. We can take what we can, as um, Al Sharpton uh, said one time, he was going to ride that donkey until he couldn't ride it anymore. Well, you know, you can do that or you can work to build the kind of real, I, I don't even want to say, um, it's just a true build alternatives to what we have. And I just spent this entire morning <laughs> dealing with young people who are sick and tired. They see through the, the manufactured dissent, which is what I believe the, um, the squad represent manufactured dissent. So you know that's gonna be limited. And in fact, uh, Whitney Webb's um, show is called Unlimited Hangout. Well, what mm -hmm. they give us is limited hangouts. So they give us as far as they can go and then they can't go any further. And that's not a real progressive. So the sooner we understand that they are not our salvation, we are our salvation, and we have to write the script for our future, that's the, then we can, you know, the sooner we'll get busy writing that script and becoming that script. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, yeah, that is, I mean, they are a limited hangout. That's exactly what they are. And it, you've talked about it before in one of the clips I have uh, on my Twitter is when you talk about the squad, you know, they're the replacement, they're the the uh, controlled opposition of sorts. And I think still a lot of people, a lot of young people still need to see that because they're branded so perfectly. They're trying to brand them so perfectly for the next generation, which is yes. why a lot of that is working. You see AOC being an influencer on Instagram. You see her, you know, doing her little videos and, and even, even people like Kamala Harris. I mean, there's a ridiculous video. I don't know if you've seen it where she's like talking to kids in a very, <laughs> just like, it is a ridiculous way. Um, it's very fake, but like they're trying to appeal to the next generations, which is why I, it's so important to point these things out. Um, I just want to know, because you've been in Congress, right? How much of our Congress receives donations from APAC? Everybody, all of Washington, D.C. is run by APAC. I mean, you know, so you, 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 you go to something like Open Secrets or you go to FEC.gov and you're trying to find out what the pro-Israel donations are. It's impossible because uh, APAC in the first place doesn't give donations. So you can't find APAC donations, but I can guarantee you can find individuals 
who are associated with APAC, who are the, the big, actually, I tell you what, it was uh, Gus Savage from Chicago, who eventually was ousted by the pro-Israeli operatives inside the, con in, and, in and outside of the Congress, um, who um, went to the floor of the house, is on my website, allthingscynthiamckinney.gov, if you go there under, um, just look for Gus Savage under speeches or something like that, you will see Gus Savage and he tells it on the floor of the house in the congressional record. He explains how the pro-Israel lobby manifests itself in campaign donations. So it could be the New Jersey Garden Club. It could be the uh, Connecticut Avenue um, uh, Petunia Club. It could be the uh, Cynthia McKinney dance team. It could be anything other than pro-Israel. And, um, but it's all of these different, differently named organizations have the same mission. It could be a women's organization. It could be an environmental organization. In fact, there's a, there was an organization, I believe it was called like Peace Pack. And I was working, now here I am, I, I am trying to get a donation from Peace Pack. I don't sign the pledge for Israel. And so see, everything is really rooted through this, did you sign the pledge? If you sign the mm -hmm. pledge or if you write the paragraph, now they've changed the tactic. So if you look at, actually I did this, I went through uh, two campaign, uh, websites of two congressional candidates running for the same post. And what I did, I did this for, I believe it was Sarah Westall's uh, Business Game Changers show. We went through the two opposing uh, candidates' websites. They've got different this, different that, different this, different that. But the paragraph on Israel was the same. So they signed the pledge. It was a different way in which you do it because before when I was there, I blew the whistle. It was a literal pledge that you had to sign your name to. But now you have to write the paragraph. You write the paragraph, you put it on your website and then everyone knows that you've been bought and sold. This is before you get to Congress. So you see, this is the problem. Most people think this is this happens after you get sworn in. No, this happens before you get sworn in. So by the time your member of Congress is sworn in, they've already been bought. They've already been purchased. And so is this mandatory? Is this mandatory? Well, if, for you're gonna get, if you're going to get peace money, if you're gonna get right. environmental money, if you're gonna get women's money, if you happen to be a woman, if you're gonna get any Washington DC money, then yes, it's mandatory. Probably the only money that comes through without that requirement would be labor unions. And that's different because the labor unions buy Israeli bonds. So you've got working class America that is putting its toil, the fruit of its toil into union dues, those union and most unions also have a bank. And those union dues, then a portion of those union dues is going to buy Israeli bonds. So I mean, it's insidious. <laughs> it's in every pocket. Well, let's just put it this way. Wherever there's a public purse, there's an Israel, there's a pro-Israeli hand that's getting a portion of it. Jeez, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I knew it was bad, but this is, this is uh, much, much worse. It's, it's worse than anything and I think most yes, people it's, are it's, aware it's of. It's much worse. So there's a, there's a, there's a um, provision in the State Department authorization bill. I am absolutely certain that it's still there because when it's not used, it becomes a slush fund. But um, so I was the ranking member on the International Relations uh, Committee, the operations uh, 
human rights and operations subcommittee. And so they that's the place in which the State Department authorization bill is born. So in order to understand what I was producing, I brought the staff in, the committee staff, which I have no role in had at that time, and um, the um, members of Congress who are uh, ranking members, uh, they don't have a role in uh, appointing the staff. So the staff was, you know, some from others. But anyway, the, the lead Democrat and the lead Republican on the full committee. Well, anyway, so um, I bring the staff in and I say, I want to go through the bill. I did this for the House, uh, for the um, Pentagon uh, budget as well. Mm -hmm. And they said, are you sure you want to do that, Congresswoman? And I said, yeah, <laughs> well, don't I, 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 aren't I responsible for this? I'm, I, I, is, isn't it that I need to know what's in the bill? <laughs> See, and these are things that got me into trouble, though, because once I learned there was one provision in there that provided $30 million every year, any Jew anywhere around the world who wants to relocate to Israel, uh, they get uh, U.S. taxpayer money to do the relocation. And um, so if there's money that's left over, then it becomes a slush fund for something else. And so you've got uh, in the Department of Homeland Security, you've got a joint task, a Jewish joint task force that's carrying out investigations of people um, I, you know, we don't have a Muslim joint task force. We don't have a Christian joint task, task force. Uh, that's in Department of Homeland Security. And um, so, I mean, literally, there's so many pockets of money. And this is $30 million just for the relocation. This is every year. And so if that line item, of course, it's never touched. So uh, in that line item, if there's money left over in the fund, it just gets used for whatever the person who's in charge wants to use it for. And so th uh, this, is, this is one of the ways that you can get um, uh, $2.3 trillion missing from the Pentagon budget and nobody, you know, uh, know it's untrackable. But Rumsfeld was not quite honest because it's it goes down as untrackable. But somebody got the two point three trillion. The question is who got it, and they know who got it, but they won't say. And then remember, the, at the time when that announcement was made, Dove Zakheim was in charge of the. He was the comptroller of the Pentagon. So, uh, and the reason that Sabelle Edmonds got in trouble was because here she is as an FBI translator, she speaks perfect Farsi. And so she's listening in and she's supposed to be um, translating in, in uh, Turkish and uh, uh, Turkish and Farsi. And she's listening in to these conversations and she hears Democratic Party operatives discussing giving nuclear <laughs> secrets and weapons to Israel. I mean, what the heck? And then she's the one who's punished. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Karen Kwiatkowski, I can keep going. Jesus. Karen keep, Kwiatkowski keep going. <laughs> is in the Pentagon and Karen Kwiatkowski was complaining uh, she eventually left the Pentagon, but you look her name up and she she's in the Pentagon and she she thinks that the Pentagon belongs to her. She's a U.S. I think she was a general or something. She's, you know, big high person. And uh, she's made to feel like she's nothing when the Israelis come in and they do their tour or whatever it is they do over at the Pentagon. And uh, Karen said they walk in as if they own the place. Why? Because they do. They do. Exactly. Because they do. So apart from Palestine, Israel's constantly bombing Syria, claiming that they are attacking Hezbollah. Why is the international community so quiet on that? And what are your thoughts on Bashar al-Assad? 
Well, <clears throat> I um, traveled to Syria several times as well. And uh, oh, and 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 by the way, the um, the the two Gaza episodes were ended with uh, George Galloway, who was punished in both the United States and in the UK for having a, an open mind when it comes to uh, Israel and Palestine. George Galloway calls me on the phone and says, Cynthia, I can get you into Gaza. I eventually got into Gaza by way of Viva Palestina the, uh, with uh, the, the land convoy uh, that was led by George Galloway. When um, I got there, then you have to look at the, what the, what the, the Muslim community, the, the, they call it the Uma, which is the Muslim world, has been completely fractured by this and its purpose is, this is all purposeful behavior. So um, you've got Shia versus uh, Sunni. So Hamas is Sunni and Hamas won the elections when the Palestinians had the opportunity to actually cast a vote, they voted to install uh, Hamas as their elected leaders and the Hamas winners were then uh, picked up and put in Israeli prison. Um, so the Palestinians, Abbas is a tool, he's a puppet. He's um, no more representative of Palestinians as was Ashraf Ghani of Afghanistan, or the, the, the good looking one who used to wear the green thing and look so good. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he was uh, good eye candy for the women, but, but he didn't represent Afghanistan, not one bit. Um, so the United States and the West are very good at going around the world and dictating to people who their leaders are. And they do it here as well, because I just spoke to, oh, Sabi, uh, Sabi, Sabi Sabs. Sabs. Sabi Sabs is a member of the Fred Hampton leftists and mm -hmm. named after the man who was killed in his sleep after having been drugged by the FBI, the Chicago police, all because they wanted to kill him in a policy of decapitation. So the organizations abroad and at home that were effective where the United States practice a policy of decapitation, which means cut off the head. You kill the head, you neutralize the head, you render the head ineffective, then you can also render the organization ineffective. And this has been done over and over and over again. So uh, uh, now with, with Hezbollah, so I'm going into this thing. So you have a video at the Aspen Institute of Michael Oren, who is the former Israeli ambassador to the United States, explaining how Israeli policy was to make sure that there was uh, a dissension fomented between the Sunnis and the Shias. Why? Because you couldn't have unity within the Muslim community on the position of Israel's responsibility to live peaceably with its neighbors. No, that couldn't be the policy. So then they make this false division. I mean, there are issues, but they make a false division between the Sunni and the Shia. And then, you, you know, it makes, it bothers me to no end to hear people in the United States parroting lines that have been fed by the propaganda that have no basis in, in reality, no basis in fact. The Hamas operated inside Israel and inside the Palestinian, the occupied territories. On the other hand, you have Hezbollah that operated inside that same Lebanon that came and rescued me when I was in trouble because of uh, Israeli arrogance and belligerence in the, in the region. And um, so now here's the thing about Hezbollah. 
And in fact, you there's a clip on uh, YouTube of Wesley Clark, if it's still there, of Wesley Clark explaining why it was why it was necessary to create ISIS. And the ISIS, Daesh, uh, Boko Haram, whatever you want to call them, were created for the purpose of initially defeating Hezbollah. Why? Because when Israel invaded Lebanon, because now remember, we have this policy, this unstated policy, because it's never going to be stated. You have to read Israeli documents like the Project for a New American Century. If you read the Oded Yanon plan, then you'll understand what motivates Israel slash US policy. They want to recreate the map of the uh, West Asia and North Africa to encompass greater Israel. It's the, called the Greater mm -hmm. Israel Project. And that's written in the Oded Yanon journal arg article uh, is written in an Israeli journal, but it's in English. You can get it. And then it's written in the uh, Project for a New American Century. Um, there was a, a, a written one written specifically for Bibi Netanyahu, not rebuilding America's defenses. The one that was written before that, I can't remember the name of it, but these are uh, resources that you can make available to your audience so that they will know that what I'm describing is grounded in Israeli fact and comes from is pro-Israeli think tanks, either there or inside the United States. And so <clears throat> what they, uh, they wrote these policies out and then they tried to carry them out for the creation of the Greater Israel Project. The problem was that militarily, despite the ascendancy of the um, Israeli military and the fact that it has the nuclear triad, which not every country has, but even countries that have nuclear weapons don't necessarily have the nuclear triad, which means that you can launch, that you can launch weapons from air, land, and sea. That's the nuclear triad, and that's uh, the Israeli capability. Well, with all of that capability, the Israelis were not able to defeat Lebanon. And in fact, if you have uh, an Israeli uh, admission in your passport, Israel and Lebanon are still at war, and so you cannot get a visa to go into to, to Lebanon. So you, you have to get, a, if you want to, you have to uh, get a different. Um, you have to get a different uh, passport if you want to go into Lebanon. So anyway, Hezbollah was responsible for the military defeat of Israel, which then made Hezbollah a priority for defeat by not Israel because Israel can't defeat them. Then they come to the United States and they expect that Israel's enemy is my enemy and so therefore my tax dollars have to go to killing Lebanese and uh, Hezbollah members. And all they have to do is say, oh, they are a member of Hezbollah. And so therefore they're terrorists. And you know, a lot, a lot of Americans, they fell for it. And part of the mm -hmm. problem that we're experiencing today is because there was no critical thinking on the part of the majority of the people of the United States. When they went to the polls and they voted, if um, their candidate said Islamic terrorism, they said, whoa, yay. And, you know, because it was something foreign. And, um, and I, I asked one, one white male, I asked him, I said, you know, how can you lose your whole country? You committed genocide of the indigenous people. You uh, trafficked Africans and enslaved them and, 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 and uh, created wealth from their enslavement, and then you lose your country, how does this happen? And you know what this, um, he was a journalist actually, um, I won't say the, because he actually told me the truth. He said, Cynthia, because they're white like us. And I said, oh my God. So now here you have, I'm born and raised in this country. I love this country. This is a country that, you know, whether it's good or bad or, you know, whatever, 
it's my country. And I want the best for the people of uh, all of the people of my country, even if they don't want the best for me. I want the best for the people of my country first. And then I want the best for people all over the world. And I want my the interactions between my country and the rest of the world. I want them to be on dig based on dignity and respect and love. I want some love in my in the foreign relations of the United States of America. I want to see that. The reason we don't see that is because there's been so much this, 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 this. And the idea that someone could say, this foreign person who doesn't care for the United States, but they share my skin color is closer to me than you are, Cynthia. I thought it was a moment of great clarity and honesty that was communicated with me by that journalist. And I will never forget him. And so now what that did was that forced me to turn around and say, okay, I've got to make friends inside this country of people who are not like me so that they can know that we have shared goals and shared values and shared principles. But now when it comes to the situation in Syria, we get the same thing. And, you know, when I, it was just about over for me when Donald Trump bombed Syria, I don't care if nobody was, was, you know, killed or whatever. The bottom line is that that administration was supposed to represent some change and um, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And um, so, you know, the United States, uh, 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 Israel, not only bomb Syria, Israel has downed a Russian airliner. Uh, uh, they continue to act with impunity. And I believe it's because people cannot, cannot talk about Israel without being punished. I was punished. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, um, but it is what it is. And, and I guess I'll continue to be punished because I've seen what I've seen and I can't unsee what I've seen. Just going off of that, when people say that, you know, when they talk about Syria and Hezbollah, they tend to condemn it. Even members of Congress who are, you know, like we just discussed, supposedly progressive, even Palestinian members of Congress like Rashida Tlaib, they will always condemn Hezbollah. They'll always talk about Bashar al-Assad being a brutal dictator. Is there any is there any truth to Bashar al-Assad being a brutal dictator? Because even in America, even here, the independent left media is, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, we need to support Palestine. We need to support Israel. But somehow it's valid journalism and you win awards by saying that a Bashar al-Assad is a brutal dictator. Is there any truth to that? Well, if you call someone elected by their own people, a dictator, then the United States has called a lot of leaders elected by their own people dictators. They just happen to disagree with them, and so therefore they're dictators. But they were elected. And in fact, elections far uh, more fair than anything we've had over here. Uh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> You know, I, that's just language that's just used, it's thrown around, it doesn't have any reality. It's just like um, the uh, language that that uh, people, uh, you know, say uh, Black Lives Matter, but, you know, it doesn't change policy. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, and I, I just kind of wanted to ask you this question because I know you get this a lot, right? you are often smeared as being anti-Semitic because you recognize the power of Israel because you talk about Palestinian rights and because of your experience as an activist. But in the way you go after the state of Israel, people have conflated that to being anti-Semitic. And I want you to explain for people who may not know what the difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is because I think there is a stark difference between uh, acknowledging and and uh, you know pushing against the power of another uh, empire facilitated by this one 
versus attacking an ethnic group of people? Okay, uh, first of all, my camera is going to change a little bit. I should uh, now see, I didn't know that question was coming, but let me see if I can just quickly find. I'm reading this book, Barbarians Inside the Gates. It's a fabulous book. That's a four part series. And it's written by a military man, a US military man, Colonel Don, D-O-N-N, two N's, De Grand Pre. And basically what he says is uh, we are at war. I don't know if you can see this. No, you can't because I have the, no. the thing. Uh, we are at <laughs> war and we are losing. So now let me just get to, um, let me see if I can find the section he lists out. See, there's so much of history that has been rewritten. Mm -hmm. uh, right. The winners the, write history. The oppressors write the history. Right. In, in, including he has a whole chapter in here on the Nuremberg trials as well. But um, he, he talks about the Havara agreement. So see, those who don't know uh, history and don't know terminology are the ones who usually do the most talking and uh, they get it wrong. And that's why they get it wrong. So we have the Havara agreement, which was an agreement that was between the Zionists and Hitler that would allow immense amounts of money from German Jewish accounts to be transferred to Palestine. This was before there was in Israel. And uh, the Havara company in Tel Aviv uh, and a sister company named Pal True in Berlin. So the money was transferred. This was to facilitate the, the, the uh, immigration of German Jews into Palestine. And people don't know this because it's not uh, because it's not really uh, discussed. In addition to that one form of um, cooperation, okay, that's the transfer. He has in this book, he lists, okay, he lists the, uh, oh shoot, I don't wanna, he lists the names, and I wrote them in the margins mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhere, of all You're right, of your the, the, the German Jews who were a part of the Hitler government. So now, I didn't learn any of this. And in fact, it took me quite, uh, okay, here we go. Let me see. Um, yeah, here we go. Here they are, their names. Rudolf Hess, Hermann Goering, Joseph Goebbels, Gregor Strasser, Alfred Rosenberg, Hans Frank, Heinrich Himmler, von Ribbentrop, Reinhard Heydrich, Ritter von Strauss, von Stein, Adolf Eichmann. So these are Nazis. Uh, let me see. These are uh, the top officers and associates of Adolf Hitler who were Jewish. Now, who would have known this? This is in this book here. This is in this book written by a US military man. Now, um, so there's a whole lot of history that we need to know, but there's some present that we need to understand as well. Anti-Defamation League, which is partially, they can take credit for kicking me out of Congress the first time because they were uh, participants in the uh, redrawing of my district, but my district was redrawn so many times in an effort to get rid of me, but they uh, were participants in that process. They claim that they are a civil rights organization, 
yet the second poorest district in the state of Georgia was denied true representation because they, the Anti-Defamation League, chose to go against that district that uh, elected me and to dismantle the district the co course, the court case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. So um, wh what I uh, want to say is that the Anti-Defamation League testified in front of the Congress and what they said was that they have a problem with Zionism uh, being anti-Semitic as well, because their definition of Zionism means that there exists a Jewish nation that has priority in the Jewish world above any state. The states don't have the same priority to Zionists as uh, does uh, the Jewish nation. And so by definition, they take exception to that definition because by definition, that means that they are anti-Semitic and they are not. Well, I would say maybe they are because they're not even Semites. <laughs> if you go and look at the constitution of Israel, then you'll see that um, Bibi Netanyahu's wife proclaimed that they were sophisticated Europeans. They're not Semitic. And so therefore, if they're sophisticated Europeans, that's why they asked to join the United Nations uh, European group and not the Asian group because they view themselves as sophisticated Europeans. Now, what does that do for the Jewish population that was there that is Semitic? These are problems <laughs> that Israelis have to work out among themselves. But what I'm saying is that the identity of anything as being anti-Semitic well, if you are in favor of the people of the region who are of Semitic background, you can't be anti-Semitic. I would say that they are anti-Semitic because my definition <laughs> is more true to who is Semite and who is not. And I just want to, you know, wrapping this up, I just have a couple of questions. One of them is relating back to your friend, your comrade that was on the USS Liberty, uh, which was the U.S. naval vessel that was attacked by Israel in 1967. What lessons can, you know, we take from that tragedy? Well, on September 10th, I reminded people who visit my Twitter feed that uh, and my uh, Facebook feed that um, on September 10th, the um, US Pentagon produced a paper that said that the Israeli Mossad was cunning enough to attack US forces and make it appear an act of the Palestinians or Arabs. That was a, a report that was given on September 10th. And then of course we know what happened on September 11th. So um, the fact that Israel attacked knowingly and now we know that they knowingly knew they carried out the attack. They knew it was a U.S. ship. They've got a, a, a seaman saying, but they're Americans. And they said, attack anyway. And uh, they killed our soldiers and uh, our, our uh, seamen. And um, they got away with it. How many crimes will these people commit and get away with it?
Do you have any advice, by the way, to Palestinian activists? I have several Palestinian friends who are activists, and uh, when they try to organize anything, the Democratic operatives come after them, and they, they have nothing to do with the Democratic Party, but they're being followed, their events are being squashed. I mean, this is, I, I, I didn't, I didn't know, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know that even at a mi micro level, when you're talking about activists and local, uh, local work towards Palestinian rights, that these people, these operatives follow them in, in unmarked cars, they yes. stay outside their houses. I mean, yes. what, when you face that as an activist, sometimes that turns people away, right? So what, yes, what methods could they try? They will try any and everything, including murder. Um, I don't think there's anything that these people will not do because they've done it before. I mean, look at our USS Liberty uh, uh, seamen. That's murder. And they got away with it. And they were helped in the cover up by uh, individuals inside our own government at the highest levels. Uh, one of the ladies that was supposed to be with us on the second trip, she herself was a Holocaust survivor and they didn't want her <clears throat> to go on that ship with us. So they pushed her. She's like 80 years old and I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, a wonderfully fierce woman. And they pushed her down and uh, she had several broken bones. Um, uh, she was wa out walking in the park and they pushed her down. Yes, there are not just threats of intimidation. There is brutality. There is physical assault and brutality. Um, and we have to understand that these people will stop at nothing. They have not stopped, which is why with reading this book and the subsequent three other books that he wrote, are so important. He also wrote a book, <coughs> um, volume two, uh, it was after September 11th, and he explained his idea of what happened on September 11th. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs was so impressed with the book, I haven't gotten to it because this is volume one, um, that he ordered 500 copies and passed them out to the other members of the higher echelons of the military. The problem is that everything is a revolving door in Washington, DC. If you stay there long enough, you can live a good life. If you uh, choose to leave, then you can go into, <coughs> sorry, I've been talking all day. Oh yeah. <laughs> you can go into a, um, uh, an Israeli supported think tank like Jack King, who comes on Fox News and he's, you know, lauded as a very strategic thinker, but people don't know that he's paid, his paycheck comes from pro Israel money. And everybody wants to get some of that pro Israel money because <coughs> there's so much of it, it's being printed to the destruction of the US economy right now. Everybody has it except the people of the US. Exactly. Well, I just wanna give Pasta uh, a chance because he wanted to ask you this question. Uh, it has nothing to do with Israel-Palestine. It's actually a quick pivot to China. And he wanted to know your ongoing <laughs> thoughts on the tensions between Taiwan and Beijing and America's role in the situation, because, you know, a lot of the, the foreign policy here, even when covered from a, a progressive lens, is oftentimes missing a lot of not only historical context, but the context from the context from Asia and yes. uh, a non-Western <clears throat> perspective. Well, um, of course, you know, in many respects, China has been set up. I think China was set up in very much the same way that James Earl Way was set up that um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was set up, that Sirhan Sirhan was set up. So you've got these people who um, were set up to become patsies. And there are some uh, individuals I have been communicating with uh, some people because I want 
the I have some friends who live in China and I want them to know that uh, I'm not anxious to go to war, but I think that there are some people who were anxious to uh, it may be even excited about cooperating with uh, certain forces over here, individuals over here in the United States. And, and these people had in, had malevolent intent. And so, you know, you get the $3.7 million, you look at the Peter Dayzak Eco Health Alliance, um, you look at their um, <clears throat> memos back and forth and you see that they were getting all of this money but the Chinese scientists didn't get very much money. They were being paid a quarter, a quarter of their regular salary. They they weren't getting the big bucks. So uh, what what truly was going on? Well, you gave them a little bit to 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 get them involved, um, and then of course it looks like they created the. Uh, had something to do with the virus. They might've had something to do with the virus, but who actually had something to do with the spike protein? <clears throat> and that was all uh, Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina. So um, when you've got these, um, and so you've got people who are thinking long, long term, and you've got other individuals who are just happy to be at the tables kind of thing. And um, so China proclaimed the one China policy, one China, uh, one China, two systems. Mm -hmm. And so um, Taiwan, it was always to be understood that Taiwan uh, was a part of mainland China. And it was crazy for anyone to think that Taiwan was going to be the representative for mainland China. Just, you know, it, it, speaking several, you know, 40 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. So um, now we're at this juncture and I believe that the Taiwanese need to be very careful because they're kind of, <laughs> they're, they're, they're patsies and they'll be used as pawns. You had the London Poles and you had, you know, if you go back, you've got the, um, the Kurds in Iraq, you, you know, so many different groups of people who have been made promises to, and then they've been let down by the United States. So I think that's the, the Taiwanese need to break bread with their brothers on the mainland and um, figure out a way to live together and not be enticed by the money that's flowing from the West because it is fleeting. And um, <laughs> uh, it, you know, when, when the guarantees are needed, the United States is not going to be there. Well, Cynthia, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cynthia McKinney, for coming on here and discussing this with us. I'm going to read to you something, uh, a super chat some, somebody said, because it's directed to you. Okay. Bubblegum Douche said, thank you so much, Cynthia McKinney and Combo. I certainly voted for you. And I know if you had become president, this world would be very different. A president who mentions Whitney Webb? Yes, please. <laughs> and there would be no COVID off, COVIDacy either. So we're not going to talk about COVID on on YouTube. That that would also inquire another uh, live stream because you know we're getting censored off the wazoo. But we've been following yes. the stories. Just wanted to read that to you. You're very much uh, appreciated and loved by the audience. So thank you very much for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thanks for those kind words. Alrighty, guys. Uh, thank you to Billum for the super rate contributions, and as always, I appreciate you guys. And we'll see you again soon. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Are we?